Joining us now, he is the ninth overall pick in the 1985 draft, a 19-year NBA pro with the Bulls, the New York Knicks, the Raptors, the Wizards, the Rockets, and the author of a new memoir titled The Last Enforcer, Outrageous Stories from the Life and Times of One of the NBA's Fiercest Competitors. We are absolutely thrilled and a little intimidated to have Charles <laughs> Oakley here with us today. Oak, how are you? Good, good. Thank you. Uh, hey. I'm just ready to get going. I'm so excited about this book and uh, <laughs> just, you know, just the time and effort man, Frank Azzola put into it and uh, really going to pay off. Really fascinating book. Uh, what was, what made you feel like now is the time to tell these stories? Well, uh, uh, just, you know, I've been out of the league for, you know, 18, 17, 18 years, 19 years, something like that. Uh, you know, thinking about a lot of stuff, you know, how, what's going to be your next avenue and this and that. Uh, but I wanted to write this book a long time ago, but now it's a good time because the pandemic, people are home. I can really get more detail with people who in life want to see, people in life like the 80s and 90s. So this book is a lot about the 80s and 90s and how the game was really played. You know how the West was won. That's how the game was played back in the days. <laughs> Listen, you said 90s and you, I'm a 90s baby. So I 100% am curious because you said that you were one of the guys who made Michael Jordan tough and everybody knows how res resilient Michael Jordan is. So how do you go about that? Like, how did you go about making MJ a resilient player during those early 90 days in, in Chicago? Well, basically he was the house. I was the furniture. So once you get a house, you got to add furniture to make it look good. So I was the house <laughs> inside the house and making it look good. But no, he's a special type guy. I think, when I came into the league, it was a tough league. You had to be tough-minded. So uh, it's some of that instilled in him when he got into the league. And he added on and, you know, being around me, seeing me handling things, handling people, making sure everything okay. I think a little of that rubbed off. But inside, he he has the toughness already with him. He just needed to uh, see another blueprint of it and add more to him. And that's why, you know, what he do every night on the court when he was playing, you know, trying to take your uh, – Hard from guys so so wait so day. so you said you he saw how you were handling things so what would you say your method of handling things like what did he see firsthand just me being a, a genuine guy for us like crafty and for us like my professional on the court off the court and how I handle the situation as a young guy so I came to the Bulls they had three power forwards I didn't like so I'm a Wait till my turn. I said, my term is now. I mean, I just got drafted. So <laughs> I didn't wait. I just knocked the door down. I like that. <laughs> what did it mean to be an enforcer for for MJ, for the Knicks? What was that role like? And is that a role that really exists anymore? I guess it's something in life. Uh, you know, uh, when you grow up, people give you nicknames, this and that. So when they gave me the enforcer, you know, the force always had been with me, and the force is just probably, you know, like making a cake that was the icing on the cake. <laughs> and people call me that. But uh, it was it was great. Uh, you know, just, you know, I just I just handled things and, you know, make mm. sure everything was okay around all my teammates when I played with them. But uh, MJ, we had a different kind of bond because uh, he took me as a rookie. He took me to the All-Star game. That was, you know, once as I went to the All-Star game with him and I made it through that, I knew I could make it through life with him. Some people might be surprised by that relationship because you then you were then traded to the Knicks where uh, you uh, y'all were fierce, fierce rivals of the Chicago Bulls, uh, leaving blood, sweat and tears out on the court. First of all, what was what was the chemistry of that Knicks team like? Was it ever an issue that y'all were friends off the court when you guys are going uh, so eye to eye, tooth to tooth on the court? Pat Riley made an issue of it, uh, you know, <laughs> fast and eyes, but, you know, one another. Uh, to me, it didn't bother me. Um, my thing was that he came to home, he get the same as uh, Reggie Miller, uh, Mitch Richmond, whoever. You know, it was my job to shut down the paint. So, when you, I mean, you, you know, it was great when I played with him, then it was great playing against him, but he's just one of them guys that uh, he don't care who in front of him, he's still going to try to go out and perform the best of his ability. You know, you brought up Pat Riley and you said playing for him was like going from being in the reserve in the military to becoming a Navy SEAL. Like, what, is, what does that mean? And, and can you describe the kind of coaching that was involved in the NBA at that time? Well, it was a lot of, in, in, I was in Chicago. I went through a couple of coaches in New York, went through five or six, but uh, 
Pat Riley, you know, he he was he always get you prepared. No, never done said nothing bad about that. He gonna work you. He gonna make the moment. Late game, you got legs, so body fat. He do all that stuff. He was just a different coach. Uh, he, I never had a coach like him my whole career uh, for his like highest detail, how he present stuff, and his game planning for every, you know, for games and stuff. Uh, he, you know, he won a championship in LA, came to New York. We went to the final, but we lost. But I mean, he just had his way. He's a control guy. Uh, you know, he did, I think he did the same thing in Miami with LeBron and all them. Somebody <laughs> said that might be the reason why he left, but. <laughs> I don't know. Do you think that can survive? <laughs> Do you think that type of coaching mm. with how the empowered athlete is moving? You know, you talked about it, the control factor. There's a lot that's controlled when you deal with a Pat Riley. Do you think that that can sustain with the new age of athlete? I think that when he uh, retired, I mean, went to be Miami uh, GM and all that, he had a chance to sit back and watch for the GM and president. He still had a chance to sit back and watch when the year they won the first championship with Wave and, and Shaq. He came back and coached that team. He see like he had op- loosened up a little. So he had came out a couple of times that he should have just early while he was still coaching. And so when he came back, he knew what to do. So he won the championship. Yeah. So I can say he did adjust, but I wish he would adjust when I was playing with him in 94. <laughs> <laughs> Take line is brought to you by Ow, ow, ooh, Underdog Fantasy, the best, easiest way to play fantasy sports through Underdog Slick mobile app. An easy-to-use website, you can draft your favorite NBA players in mere minutes and compete for cash prizes every single night of the week. Just head to underdogfantasy.com or download their app from the App Store slash Google Play Store and Underdog will double your first deposit up to 100 bucks with the promo code TAKELINE. So what are you waiting for? Sign up with the code TAKELINE, get your deposit match, and draft your NBA Dream Team today and lift your leg on the competition. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, writing this book with Frank Isola, Frankie Ice. How, how, do, how did y'all work together? Like, what was the process like of, of, of bringing these stories out? Well, it was hard because, you know, Frank got like five jobs. So uh, <laughs> we was trying to get <laughs> two hours in here, two hours in there. And we just, you know, we just kept piecing together because it was a lot of thought and, and time went into this book. If you, you know, once you read it, you can see that it wasn't just like I give Frank an outline, he just try to, you know, follow the outline. Now, uh, so my details, his research over or, or, or the years, what happened, numbers wise, details. So we had to basically, we were working, we did a good job working together. We could have been, uh, we could have been a, uh, maybe a group, we could have been two lead singers, and both have our own roles as singers. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And so I'm curious because, you know, you lead singers. And when you think about the celeb status of everything, that era you were playing in, it was huge. But there was also a celebrity following when you guys were filming Space Jam. And, you know, you mentioned a long list of celebrities that showed up to see you guys play while filming. So what was that experience like? And and who showed up? I'm just curious, like, who was there? I mean, L.A. Who was in L.A. (laughs) who had a car? And then we was at the, <laughs> at the parking lot. And, and we was inside a bubble. We, we was inside a bubble. I mean, it was like at least five, 6,000 to watch a pickup inside wow. a bubble. It was like that amazing. That's crazy. That was amazing that I, they pulled that off. I don't know what happened with LeBron when they shot Space Jam, but uh, it was real nice. Hollywood was, Hollywood was in the Space Jam, in the bubble, in the parking lot. And Were they was, cheering? Was it like a real game atmosphere? Oh, it in there? was. It was like, yeah, it was like you know, everybody was you know pulling, pulling pants up, tightening shoes up. So, <laughs> so if you lose, you got to wait three or four games. Did anybody want to wait? Because the stars crazy. there. Crazy. Yeah. So if you had to wait, so you had to sit on the sides. And and then a couple of the players that were there, just because I want to like paint the picture for people of what I would have showed up to. I'm gonna tell you right now, I'd have been one uh, of that five thousand. Anybody in the building. who had a name, just about <laughs> the guys who was in Space Jam showed up. You had you know MJ. I mean everybody. Um, I mean uh, it was everybody who was playing back in the area was in the you know there was there in the movie was, and, but he wasn't filming. They was there playing. They played only played about five games, but still though they was there. Wow. Finally, is uh, any any predictions for this NBA season, Charles? What, uh, as you're watching the games, and any anybody jump out as finals contender, p- a potential finals candidate? Well, you know, they were saying uh, in the East probably Brooklyn and Milwaukee favorite. In the West, probably be Phoenix and Golden State. Yep. 
If you ask me, I don't know who gonna be there until maybe the, you know once the conference start, you know the playoffs start, a couple of rounds go past. But right now it's just everybody beating everybody. But you got you know I think Phoenix is getting stride. Brooklyn still trying to find this up. Milwaukee trying to pick it up. Uh, Philly, you know they don't know what Simmons is gonna do. And out in the Lakers, I mean they still waiting on the bus. <laughs> they missed the bus. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Win one, lose one. They get happy when they beat a bad team. They beat Orlando, they feel happy. Then go lose to Miami, down 20 something. And I don't know. I know LeBron probably ain't happy what's going on. But no, for uh, sure not. I think I was I'm I'm hoping he can pull the Lakers together because mm. it'd be sad for you got four Hall of Fames on the team yeah. and you could be like a play in team. His name is Charles Oakley. He played 19 seasons in the NBA. And his new book, The Last Enforcer, is out today, wherever you get your books. Charles, thank you for joining Take Line. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.